there's a liminal space where language becomes muddled and I think sound almost transcends written, written form, written text, and brings us together in a way that language is not always able to. Um, I would love for you to speak a bit more about your time in Lagos and how your experience pulling together this, this field footage. What does it look like your average day then? What did it look like going out? What do you have with you? What's the process like? I'll start by saying um, it's interesting you talk about how languages get uh, modeled in Lagos. And uh, I recently, I would, it's not recent, but when I listened to a lot of field recordings I did on Lagos, especially in the market, it's actually the Yoruba language and the Igbo language that stands out there all the time. And you know, you just realize that Lagos is a kind of bubble of languages. I mean, there are other languages, but these are two languages that I'm quite familiar with. Um, in terms to what my days do look like while recording here in Lagos, it's, uh, it's really typical. You know, I, the first time I started recording, I always tried to have this plan. Like you set up this timeline of how you are going to dive into Lagos and hunt for sound. But with experience, I stopped doing that kind of uh, setup. For me, it was more like, let's see what the day brings let's see what you find out let's see what the city reveals to you every day so i think it was really a, a smart idea for me to let the city guide me on what to do without having sketches but i also think it's related to my practice i'm not one of those artists that have to make a um a sketch before i create a work i'm more into coming up with a sketch after in the process of creating the work. So I like basically freestyling. So for me, it's like going out and hunting in the city for sound. Most times I do not know what I'm looking for. But when shooting this video, I think I also took the same approach, like just trying to get as much footage and montage as possible. But there were things that I was looking out for, like some iconic um, um, uh, symbols, like the bridge, for example. I knew I wanted the bridge to be on this shot. And um, this was also when uh, this whole idea of Rem Cool House's um, documentary on Lagos, the wide and narrow, I don't know if that's the title, but I also chose to take that approach in this video to have this kind of intimate shots and also like broad shots that are less intimate. So this was typically uh, my, the concept in my head going out there. But in terms of shooting, you know, Lagos has always been problematic for you to uh, document, really. And uh, it's uh, a different experience depending where you go. You either have to spend money or you also have to fight your way through to do things. But depending on how expensive the equipment is, you, you choose your battles carefully. So um, uh, I was out a lot shooting, sometimes from my car, sometimes getting down, sometimes negotiating with the... Uh, area boys, especially the, the touts and the, and the park. And um, same with the sound. But uh, it's this process that you have to try to explain what you're doing. And I think fortunately, it's become easier, or even around that period, because a lot of music videos were also being shot. And so they got a little bit used to the idea of having cameras or sound recording equipment around the city. But that means they will charge you more as an artist trying to come and document, because as far as they're concerned, this is not, you're not just making art, you're, you're making a music video. Or let me, they paid them 100,000, so you have to pay them 100,000 or something close to that. But um, I realized that this was also part of the interesting aspect of working in Lagos, because the, the process of bantering or like negotiating with these guys brings you close to them. And you can tell them about your work or, or you know, just, been becoming friends for, with them after paying them the first time, maybe the second time, you don't have to pay them. And that also lets you to become more intimate with them, to talk to them and find out more about their lived experiences in these places. Because at some point I didn't want to just keep recording um, the soundscape as a broad uh, recording, but more like talking with the conductors, for example, and getting to know their legal stories. So it was a very interesting um, process for me in general. Yeah. 
Can you tell us about how and when you decided that sound was a medium that you wanted to dedicate at least your practice in part to? I mean, I'm going to be honest here. Um, I think uh, I, didn't, I didn't make this decision per se. It sort of, it sort of happened for me. I, uh, when I, when I, the, whole, the whole story, I'm sure I've told this so many times, but after attending this sound workshop in, in, in uh, Fayoum in Egypt, uh, it, I, didn't, I didn't actually go there to become a sound artist. I was traveling, I was curious, and I happened to do this. And um, I believe if I didn't come, if I, if I wasn't living in Lagos, I wouldn't be doing this. Uh, because out of everyone that went to this workshop or this media class, I'm the only one working with sound. The instructor for the media class is a very good friend of mine. He doesn't work with sound anymore. You know, so I think coming back to Lagos, which is a sound city, but I didn't realize it then because you, are, you get used to all this so-called noise. I don't call them noise anymore, but you know, we become so used to it that we never try to find the beauty in it. So what going to Fayoum did for me was sort of open my ears to listen more. And I come back to Lagos, and I realize there's so much to listen to, what we take for granted. And um, I moved to Lagos. I didn't, I didn't grow up here. So the whole process of recording these sounds became a way for me to discover Lagos. Because I had to be out there, I had to ask questions, I had to do recordings, and I had to come back to my studio and listen to these things. And I wasn't actually doing it for... Um, I was doing it for myself. I was just curious, trying to put into practice what I learned there. I wasn't thinking about uh, being an artist. I studied arts, but I majored in graphic design, and I was doing more works with web development and graphic design in general. I didn't ever think of trying to have art as a full practice. But, um, you know, um, BC was one of the major influencers here and also the AAF as Mwabogo when I did uh, the first installation. But it's that kind of uh, catalyst that activated the whole process of uh, taking it more seriously, let's put it like that. I remember the first uh, talk I gave on the sound was in um, uh, Cape Town in 2009 for the um, Africa Urbanity Project. I think BC was invited for the project to talk about Lagos, and she's like, she doesn't have time, but there's this guy he met, she met that sort of is exploring the city in an interesting way, that in the way she finds interesting and the sound, maybe you should talk to him, and they're like, oh, do you want to do a, a presentation on your sound work? I think I did it. Ngone uh, was, was around there, and um, Elvira, and then that, that was uh, then I did a show with Elvira because she's like, yeah, well, I'm doing this show in um, in uh, uh, in uh, Madrid, and I think what you're doing is interesting. Do you want to show? Your, do you want to show your sound? And I'm like, yeah, but you know, like I have no clue. I really have no clue what I'm doing. I'm just recording, and I find it interesting. And but just trying to put it out there to think about how you want to show your sound or exhibit it. You have to go into that thought process of trying to pull this off. How does this work? And I remember like uh, paying a ticket to go to Art Forum in Berlin before then to just figure out, you know, what are people doing with sound? You know, because there's no one working with sound around me. Everything was really what I read online and the books that I ordered, but I've never ever experienced a sound installation. So I flew to Berlin, went to Art Forum, and checked out Berlin that period and saw a couple of sound installations and that sort of activated that thought process of trying to do these things uh, or how do I present the sound, how do I talk about a city that I live in, how do I set up the speakers in a way to give you an immersive experience and that basically led to it. After the Madrid gig, I was invited by Ngone to do a show in, um, in uh, Roskede in Denmark which, which is about, uh, it's called locality. It's really about the, uh, the places you come from. And really that was how my career as an artist started. Yeah. 
When was that? Can you remember? Uh, this was 2010, right? Yeah. So my actually my career started 2010. Yeah. So we're going to move on now beyond the Yellow Haze um, to the Venice Biennale. And it's quite a big leap because there are a few years in between when you first started working. And I think the ways in which your practice have, has developed. Um, I would love for you to speak about the transition from working as an artist alone in the fields, collecting your material, and then working on it alone in your studio. How you transition from that experience to the collaboration that uh, resulted in the work exhibited in the Biennale in 2015, which as many of you will know is uh, the foremost Biennale of art in the world. Um, so. um, I mean, I have to say this, I'm very fortunate uh, let's put it like that. You know, it's not a, it's not, a, it's not like if I'm the hardest working artist out there. But I'm, I was very fortunate. I got invited to, um, I think it was True Koyo, to ask um, if I would be interested in, a, like, sh she wanted to suggest my name as an artist for the DAAD which is one of the most prominent residences in the world and is based in Berlin. And she's like, do you want to, I mean, if you get accepted, you have to spend one year in Berlin. And I'm like, I don't want to live in Berlin. I don't want to spend one year in Berlin. You know, and uh, I think I didn't actually follow up with her, but I got an email like, where's your portfolio? You were supposed to send it to me. And I'm like, okay, I sent her my portfolio and, um, uh, I think she submitted it. There's supposed to be a jury that it's, it wasn't her decision, but the jury had to decide if you get accepted to be part of the residency. And I remember actually was in Berlin a day before and um, I was having a conversation with someone and they were talking about the DID. I'm like, yeah, I think my name was sent in, but I don't think I was going to get it because it's very, you know, it's, it's a very uh, popular residency and there's a lot of, it's very competitive. And I get on a train to go to Vienna, and I was in Comunicado between uh, Vienna and, uh, and uh, between uh, Berlin and Vienna. And I get to Vienna and I uh, open my email and they're like, oh, uh, congratulations, um, you were accepted to be in Berlin. And I remember feeling like, oh, it's happening. Like, I don't think I want to, I'm not sure about this, if I want to spend one year in Berlin. You know, I thought, I thought it would be something that will sort of disrupt what I'm doing because then I was really getting sucked in into working with Lagos, working with the soundscapes. And I'm like, I don't think this could work, but let's give it a try. So I moved to Berlin in um, August of 2014 to start off the residency. And visiting Berlin is not the same like when you're living in Berlin. So um, one of the first things that struck me was there's really no sound to record in Berlin. I mean, what will I be spending my time doing during this residency? But these are like situations that make you think or like uh, you have to reevaluate what you're doing. Okay, then I don't want to record Berlin. What else do I do? I started thinking um, alternative, alternative uh, uh, things to do with sound. And one of the things that came up was working, checking the archives for past sound, which I did a lot of it. But Berlin is really into music, into sound. There's so much opportunity when it comes to working with sound. And um, I dived into it head first. And I remember um, being in studios with artists, composers, mostly electronic music. But um, the best thing that happened then was I, was, uh, I also had to be part of this competition for um, the German government just built um, a new building at the, at the African Union headquarters, and they were trying to uh, commission artists to create an artwork for this building. And um, I was, I, was uh, I think they invited 50 something artists to apply, and I did an application that focused more on a sound installation, and that won the prize, that, that won the commission. 
And um, I remember um, doing a lot of research on archives and trying to work with voices, because when you're talking about the African Union, it's a multiple uh, countries under one union speaking different languages. So I was thinking of how to bring this whole idea into a sound installation. And it was in that process of working on this that I got an email from Okuye, who I never met him before, and uh, basically asking, um, um, yeah, we'll be interested in inviting you for Venice, but we need to know what you have in mind before we decide if you are going to make this. So for me, one of the quickest things to think about was creating a sound piece in multiple languages. And I was right in Berlin when the whole refugee movement started, and I realized that there's this whole talk about citizenship. You know, if you are different, um, you could get questioned where you're from. What I mean by that is that you have German citizens that are black or dark skinned, but could be asked where are you from just by not looking German. Um, in that direction, also with what I've been doing with the AU, my proposal was to work with um, multiple languages and to uh, thinking about the sound to now use for this installation. What is that music? What is that sound that sort of unifies the country, even if not everyone accepts it? Uh, that's how I stumbled upon the, the working with the German anthem. So what I did for this piece is a 10-channel sound installation in uh, 10 African languages. We have Igbo there, we have Yoruba there, we have Douala, we have Bamun. It's like languages across West Africa and East Africa. And um, the idea was to translate the German language, uh, German anthem into 10 African uh, languages and then compose it to the same musical connotation of the anthem and have it performed all at the same time. I mean, uh, I think I was being very ambitious when I was thinking about this project, also to impress the, <laughs> the um, Okri to get, to get into Venice, really. So when it came down to actualizing this project, I realized I had a problem, you know, because they said, oh, we like the project, now you have to deliver the project. And uh, for me, it was, uh, okay, how, no one has done this. How do you go ahead trying to do something that you couldn't have a reference for? Um, but that's one of the things about being in Berlin, having access to studio production, having access to people that have done a lot of work with sound. Uh, it's really different working with music and working with sound, because with sound installation, the job is not finished in the studio that is like less than 50% of the work getting the sound in the studio, you have to think about the installation space. And um, so I was fortunate to find, I had an assistant who was very brilliant. He was fortunate to find um, an African choir based in uh, Berlin that had people from different parts of Africa. So we spent months putting together, uh, translating the German anthem into these 10 languages and um, fortunately for me, the, uh, the, the composer for this choir was also very brilliant in trying to put, set this, uh, arrange these um, translated uh, languages into the German anthem, which um, I think is from, it's actually uh, also like a hymn in the, in the, in the, in the church. And it's, it was composed um, uh, in 18, century or something like that. So, but he was able to put this together and we spent weeks rehearsing on singing this German anthem in these languages. It's, I mean, it's never been done before. They've never done a project like this before. That is where we took, it took all our time to do. But then how do you also install this piece that it becomes interesting because we could do an installation where um, uh, it's on loop, the same thing. But I had that interesting idea that instead of trying to put it just on loop, let it be an anthem that comes, it starts with one language, one voice, then other languages come in, other singers come into it, just like a choir performing in real time, but in a way where it starts with one, the other nine gets plugged in, and they all finish together. 
and also how do we deliver this. But then uh, um, when you talk about collaboration, that's what's kind of what opened my mind into collaborating a lot of people across the, across the field, not just in arts. I had to start looking for a programmer, and I found this brilliant guy in, the, in London who could write a program. He designed a program for this installation that randomly selects the starting language and randomly plugs in all the languages. And with this program, you could have 50, 000, over 50,000 outcomes that are not the same. So if you are in this space, in this installation, you could not hear the possibility of hearing the same sequence of um, the singing is almost zero. And uh, we didn't have time to test this. This was finalized during the installation. So we weren't sure if everything would work out. He flew in into Venice, and it was a bit chaotic. Last minute, we all got into Venice because I was not hearing from the uh, biennial people. They were also caught up with a lot of artists. Last minute, we tested everything in that space, and it worked out. So this is how this project was born, and it's now in the collection of the German government. It was problematic working with the German anthem because um, the full anthem, the first verse of the anthem was banned because the Nazis used it a lot. So the Germans are not very favorable with their national anthem. So they were a little bit skeptical, you know, why do you want to work with this anthem? We don't think it was going to work out. But I think when this, when this piece came up, my assistant is German then, he, he started crying because he's never heard the German anthem for him. It's like this is the most beautiful um, version of the German anthem you ever heard. And I remember when we did this piece in Venice, it became like uh, a hit because it stays in your head. When you hear this choir perform it, and you actually think the choir is inside the uh, installation space. So, that was it. The Sangha Sembo Bon Soni So this is a stereo file. Now imagine this in 10 channels, like it's a full immersive piece, and the speakers are set in the heights of the, of the singers. So it was a completely full immersive piece, and it's still one of my favorite. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Emeka. So we'll move on to another very um, prestigious commission of yours, the Documenta 14 Commission the way earthly things are going. It'd be wonderful for, for us to hear about this project. Uh, it's very different in execution and concept, um, but in ways the threads of displacement, immigration carry through. Um, I'll just post it here. So this piece was commissioned for uh, Documenta 14 in 2017, and I was, um, for the first time, I don't, I'm sure many of you know about Documenta. It's normally held in Kassel in Germany. But for the first time, they decided to move the, you know, uh, split it between two cities, Athens and Kassel. And we were invited to create a new work for um, Documenta, starting with Athens. And um, if you know the story of Greece, during this period, they were really going through a financial crisis. Like it was a major, it's still, it's still an issue till today. So I spent a lot of time living in Athens in 2016, researching. I wanted to focus on financial crisis because a lot of artists were really working with the whole idea of displacement, refugees, 
I decided to focus my research on a financial crisis and um, uh, spent months in uh, Athens working on this. The original concept for this piece, you know, it's also like I, I, I'm very flexible when I'm, when I'm creating a work and I really, um, things could change till last minute. The original concept of this piece was um, a rotating circular platform, 12 channels of sound, um, uh, and all set up in the clock uh, formation. You sit in the, there's a chair, there's a sitting arrangement on this platform, and it slowly rotates just um, anti-clockwise to the earth. But um, that was what I had in my sketches. It was fine um, till the last minute. But the sound aspect, the idea was um, to find a way to convert my research into a musical composition and have it performed by a choir. That was the original idea. And that was what I was working till last minute when I also had a situation with the composer. But um, in coming up with this idea of uh, this piece, I wanted to also present the same piece in Kassel. So the idea was to work with a um, Greek composer in Athens and work with a German composer in Kassel. Also looking at the relationship between these two countries, which has been going on for a very long time, even before the financial crisis. Um, so we did the whole, we spent months working on the composition and the last minute things that didn't work out. And this was practically two months or less before the opening. I also didn't have a installation space for the, for the work. And um, I, th I remember spending a lot of time in uh, Athens, walking around the city, looking for an installation space. And one of the places I found that I really liked was the best stock exchange in, uh, in uh, Athens, right? It was built in 1890 something. Still, they renovated it. It still had this whole old uh, classic uh, facade and, and uh, interior. And I thought it would be a very nice piece, place to install this work. That sort of uh, explores the whole idea of financial crisis because with financial crisis, it's really about the stock market. Those are the first things that crash when you, before you start having issues. And uh, last minute, they decided that they were going to charge uh, maybe a thousand euros a day. And if you think about Documenta being for like 90 days, that's like 90,000 euros rent just to install the work there. That also didn't happen, so I had to find uh, an alternative space. But in terms, of the, in terms of the idea of the work itself, I wanted to combine the composition with these stock numbers. And the idea now was how to bring these two together, because I wanted to have visual to this composition. And I, during that process, I kind of settled with having um, a setup that looks like the stock market. You know, my reference was really the stock exchange. Yeah. No, we'll get there, but because I want to talk about this space. Yeah, we'll get there, but. Um, my reference was the was the was the um, stock exchange, so I wanted to bring that into the piece. How do I reference the stock exchange? But I also wanted to do it in a way that it's live. So um, last minute, when the composition didn't work out, the ladies that were supposed to be in the choir for the for the song, they are called Pleiades. It's an all female group um, based in Thessaloniki. And they perform uh, traditional, classical Greek um, um, and songs from the Epirus. They had this hit. Uh, one of their hit songs was um, the, the, the English translation is "When I when I remember when I when I forget I'm happy." So it's basically looking at the idea of displacement because in the Epirus region, they, when they were occupied by the Ottomans they had to pay uh, taxes to them, and if they didn't, because they didn't have money, they were poor, it's really in this mountainous location in uh, Greece, so they weren't farming much, so they didn't have money. So their men were being abducted and being taken over to work for them. So this piece is actually like a, a song that 
kind of like uh, looks at uh, it, it's it's uh, it's it, it looks at this displacement and it's really about it's a lamentation song. And uh, along the line, I realized this would be the perfect soundtrack to this installation because what happens with financial crisis is people also get displaced. A lot of Greeks were leaving the country to find jobs all around Europe, and the Greeks were really these people that were into this family bond, you know. So this was also happening in the 21st century for them, but this is a displacement call by, caused by financial crisis. That was how we came up with this song and also working with this uh, stock feed. But that's also the challenge. How do we now create a stock feed? Because I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a, this is not a stock exchange. Bring it into the space. I also found uh, a programmer that wrote a program that goes, it goes online all the time, pulling stock feeds from across the world and, and um, displaying it on the stock exchange. We'll get to the picture. But I want to talk about the space. This was the biggest space I've ever installed before the space. And it was a kind of last minute decision because I was in Berlin and I got a call like, we think, I think we, we think we found a space for you uh, and you have uh, 15 minutes to decide if you are going to take the space or not. Check your email. I looked at my email, I saw this, I saw some pictures, I saw the floor plan, and because I didn't have any space, and desperate enough, I said yes. And I had to fly to Athens the next morning. I remember getting into this space, and I'm like, this is not possible. You cannot install sound in a space like this. This is a music, uh, um, um, this is uh, a theater in the music uh, department, in a, it's called Odeon in Athens. It's never been used before. It's abandoned. It's in the raw state. It's complete concrete. The echo, the echo in this space is roughly like eight seconds. So that's a lot. So I, I, I check the space and I'm, you know, this is never going to work. But from my experience, I, I like the space to speak to me. So I sat down in this space for over an hour, just trying to absorb the space as much as possible. And I thought, okay, it's possible to do something, but maybe we have to put like sound absorbers in this space. This is huge. I started making calls. They said it's possible, but it's going to take three quarter of your budget to set up something that could cut the echo by just like 30%, not even completely. And um, I wanted to work with uh, the locals as much as possible. I didn't come with my sound designer from Berlin. I call this guy from the university. He walks into the space and it's like, you know, say no. We're not going to do anything in this space. It's not possible. And I tell him, like, let's sit down here. We sat down in this space for another hour. And he was like, yeah, maybe we do this. Maybe we do that. Maybe we do this. We found this lady. I didn't even know there were people that their job is to understand how sound works in spaces. Like, you know, they go to school for this. So she came with all her fancy computer sketched the space, did some tests, decided like this is where we're going to put the sound absorbers to maximize their impact, but it's still going to be expensive, you know. And um, can we flip this? Um, so these are the ladies that I worked with. Um, I worked with, they are the Pilates. But when I realized that part of the Epirus, what they did with music was they sing to the mountains, which is echoing and it bounces back to them. That's how the, a lot of their music is performed. I thought it would be a good idea to bring them into the space. And instead of trying to spend all our money putting this absorption, let them try and work with the space before going into the studio. So the next, the next image is really them walking around the space, reciting the, the music. They, the music is originally theirs, but the intro to the music are mostly political speeches that I found during the research on the, on the, on the Greek uh, financial crisis. So the lady spent a whole day in this space, walking around, practicing, almost like how it was done with the mountains in the old days. The echo bounces back. You just realize how you can work with the echo instead of trying to fight it. So we went into the um, studio and what we now did was, during the rehearsals for the music in the studio, the effect the studio engineer was doing was the same um, um, seconds of echo you find in the space. So they are singing the way they do, but on their headsets, it was echoing like they were in the space. 
So this was how we were able to create the first uh, music we did for the space there, and um, had the, uh, uh, the programmer deliver this software that pulls stock indexes from around the world in real time. And this was how this piece was born. You know, I, I think they can just flip through. But it now also came to mixing the, 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 the sound. I mean, we, we could spend all the time doing it in the studio, but I decided to move the studio into the, into the installation space. So we did the, mi the mixing live in the space instead of in the studio. For the first time, I've never done like a mixing inside, uh, inside my installation space. Normally, you go there with the finished product. And um, how is that different than the process of conceiving of a work outside of your studio space and in the space it was to be installed? It's, it's this whole thing about letting the space speak to you. And part of my rule now is I try not to change the space. The space existed before my idea. So instead of trying to change the space to fit into my idea, I want my idea to fit into the space. So that's why I decided to sit down here. Uh, we spent hours here, and it, it was freezing in Athens then. And this, this had no heating. It was completely um, hardcore. But we pulled it off. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, the image of the sl on the slide uh, for the, for the it's, yeah. So it's a 12-channel sound installation um, of this uh, music and real-time stock index. Um, so this is what it looks like. Uh, the colors from the stock exchange, because with the red, the red signifies when the stock is falling, the green when it's rising, the blue when it's steady. So you also had this movement of, of numbers that would slow down to the soundtrack of the music and then with these colors, it's really darker than this space. It became almost mesmerizing. This colors moving in this space and um, lightening of the space and this music on migration. It was also like this slow movement of people too, so. Ladies and gentlemen, just so that you note, we have 15 minutes to the end of this session. Yeah. Ushers will be walking around with cards and pens for you to put down any questions you may have for our speaker over the next 15 minutes. Thank you. All right. Help us to just move the audio forward a bit, please. While they do that, I had a question again about the placement of the speakers, because I think it's interesting to think about how you're working with sound, but you're also working with the visual experience that accompanies the sound. So um, in the song to the Germans, you talked about the placement of the speakers reflecting the heights of the various singers. I wondered if you could talk about the aesthetic decisions you made in the piece in Athens, the placement of the speakers, the placement of the stock market numbers. Yeah, I mean, um, there are different kind of speakers. So it starts with trying to have the speakers that you put on a, on a, um, a pole, which makes them look like humans standing so you think about those aesthetics instead of, I mean, we could, they, they could also put it on planes, but I wanted to put it on a pole that made it look like you had these human beings standing in a circle because it's a complete circle of uh, 12 channels of sound. 
and then the sounds are placed in the degrees of the clock because it's a show of time, movement around that, the, the clock. That's why it's called the way earthly things are uh, going, which is a line from Bob Marley's song, So Much Trouble in the World. And this is really a song that sort of captivated the mood of how things were going in terms of this whole financial crisis, wars, displacement of people, natural disasters, global warming, everything happening in this period. So it's like so much trouble in the world. And I saw that actually I wanted to use that so much trouble in the world, but that would have been a bit um, like a cliche, you know, and it's easy to point out that it's from there. But I saw this line, the way earthly things are going, no one knows what was gonna happen. So I just took the, the line, the way earthly things are going. So that's how the title came about. And the sounds were, the speakers were placed like a clock, the, the degrees of the clock around uh, the space. Then we have the, the LEDs, Op uh, directly opposite if you are standing on that place. So it, that's how the aesthetics worked in this place. But it's been installed in the Tate tanks. It also recently was installed in this deactivated nuclear tower, which is my favorite item uh, so far. And um, you also have to think about all the spaces every time you are installing it and how it comes. But I try to keep it as original, uh, like the first installation, as much as possible. So, therefore, it's a site-specific piece in response to the first site. It was installed primarily, and then you adjust it slightly. Yeah, you, for you adjust them slightly, and um, I like playing with the idea of light, where it's not so uh, well lit up. So, many times you may not spot the speakers around you standing out so uh, um, uh, conspicuously. It also adds a, a kind of element to it where you, do, you don't have the speakers all in your face and you are knowing, oh, these are speakers. Sometimes, if, like if you close your eyes in this space, you think the singer is actually inside the space. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. I think the form, the circular form in which the speakers were configured for the way the earthly things are going and also for um, the song to the Germans is a nice segue into Ama. Um, so it'd be great to hear you talk about this recent project of yours. Very ambitious. Is it your most ambitious to date, do you feel? All right, go ahead. Um, so I was invited by uh, Cleveland Museum to, to um, create a piece. Actually, the way early things are going sort of inspired them to invite me to work with this atrium. Because the way things are going, the, there's the curator, Reto. Reto was the curator from uh, Cleveland that was visiting Documenta. And he saw this installation, the way things were going. And he saw the huge scale of this um, uh, auditorium. And um, they've been thinking for a while to commission artists to create works for the uh, atrium. And uh, he thought it could be interesting to invite these artists that had um, done this kind of work on this scale to be the first artist commissioned to make a work for this atrium. And he thought I was a woman because uh, in, in uh, his, his Swiss, and my name with the N K A K-A, is feminine. And um, a friend of mine, Smooth and Zewi, moved to Cleveland Museum, and Rito was talking, telling him, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm considering inviting this, since you're Nigerian, maybe you know this Nigerian female artist that did this work that I liked in, uh, in, uh, in Documenta. His name is Emeka and Smooth say no, he's not, a, he's not a woman, uh, he's actually my friend. So I get an email from Cleveland Museum to fly in and look at the space. Of course I was excited to go and I remember walking into the space and thinking, um, I think I shot myself on the foot because the pictures don't do the space justice. This is the biggest space I've ever seen enclosed to start with. And now you have to think about an artist, how do you, how do you feel the space, you know? Um, so I, I, I had a, I think I had five days in Cleveland and I spent most of the five days just sitting uh, at a corner in this space and observing mostly. Because they, they asked me, what do you want to do? I'm like, I don't know. Let me, <laughs> let me see, uh, let me spend time here and see um, how it works out. Um, so 
at the end of uh, the third day, I had to have a meeting with them. And they're like, do you have any idea? I'm like, you know, what I noticed was I was observing people in the space, and, uh, and uh, uh, I was really more interested about how this space functioned. And thinking in, uh, in line with that, this is the heart and soul of the museum. It's also a gathering point for the museum. People come here, interact. Uh, there's a restaurant on the other end of the side. And um, prior to that, I've been doing a lot of research with the Igbo culture. I'm Igbo. I decided to start doing a lot of uh, uh, work with Igbo sounds. It still was something in my head, but I've been researching and uh, looking at how sound worked in the Igbo uh, culture. Music performances, masquerades, um, folk songs. And um, in the Igbo culture, there's uh, something we call the village square. It's called Ama in Igbo. And uh, it's the heart and soul of the Igbo communities. It's also a social uh, space. Sometimes it's converted into a market. And um, I'm like, you know, I think I'll give this a shot and think about a work around the Igbo culture that reflects what the village square does in the Igbo culture. And um, the first time I, I proposed that, you know, I remember them saying, uh, you know, they don't know anything about the Igbo culture. So for them, they were like, uh, we're not so sure. But I, I, I practically put my foot down. and like, listen, this is what I want to deliver. And um, I, I want to go with it. So then I had no idea of um, how the piece will turn out. I was more focused on how to install or what kind of sounds to bring into uh, Cleveland. Uh, originally, I was looking at um, the possibility of working with a Cleveland uh, orchestra uh, from the opera to deliver a new composed piece entirely. That was before I came up with this idea. That was one of the first things that struck my head. But uh, after spending time in this space, I scrapped it completely. But um, in the, I never had thought about like putting up a tree in this space. But when you start looking at pictures, images of village squares around Africa, one of the central features of village squares is always like this big tree right in the square. And uh, the village now uh, happens around. Everything now happens under this tree or by that corner. So halfway in the process of uh, still researching, I now send them an email like, uh, we need a tree for the, for, the, for, the, for the village square if we have to do this. And it has to be a big tree because your atrium is big. And um, researching with the Igbo culture, I also stumbled upon the Akwete fabrics. Because I was thinking of how do I bring in a visual component into this installation. And um, I stumbled upon the Akwete, and we decided to bring in the Akwete as much as we can. My original idea was to drape them on walls over. But in the, in the working process, I decided to create more like something functional. In the village squares, you have seats. Sometimes you don't have seats. People bring with their seats. The idea now was how to convert these fabrics into a sitting arrangement. Then the idea of the tree now came up. I wanted to have the fabrics covered in the trees. This is not your typical Akwete design. This is from the NCBD. It's a it's NCBD pattern that signifies trees. I wanted it to be woven into the piece. So the research now you did all these NCBD symbols, and I asked the women from Akwete if they can create my design, and they said yes. That was how we came up with this tree. And um, we also had the traditional Akwete fabrics. But it's a big space, how do you split this? So this installation is split into three, three zones. This is the first zone with the tree, and there's uh, speakers on top, of the, on top of the tree, where we have this uh, flute piece going on. Then this, the second zone is the circle of a uh, 14 channel sound. So I had a, an Igbo um, choir, a choral group perform 12 Igbo songs in uh, 12 channels, by, and the, the, sec the, the other two extra channels were for the instruments. Then the Aquata fabrics were converted into poofs and uh, where people can lounge and be in the space to re re completely reenact this whole idea of the, the gathering, the village square, where people come chill out and, uh, um, and have music performed for them. So it's really this immersive piece where when you're in the middle of this, uh, we set up the, uh, the poofs right in the middle. In the middle, you get the sweet spot of all the 
12 channel sound coming together in the middle. And if you shut your eyes, you completely feel that the choir is right next to you on that piece there. So it's, it's worked beyond my expectation. And uh, for a huge space like this, the only works that can fill the space is a sound piece. So you have uh, the sound resonating around the space, but if you want to experience it as an immersive piece and to get to the sweet spots, you move your poof right to the middle, but you also have the possibility of moving your poofs around the space in general. So is this my most ambitious piece? I think so, in scale, in uh, budget, and also in production. I wanted to ask you a question about this process the beginning of this process specifically because you mentioned something that I think we should highlight. You said the museum expressed doubts about a piece that highlighted Igbo heritage, but you pushed for that. And I want to know, in the process of collaborating with people, with institutions, you have your vision, they have theirs. As an artist, how have you navigated those negotiations? Um. The only thing I would say is, as an artist, you need to realize you are the most important element of that production. Without you, it's not happening. So if you want to do something, push for it. You know, and I, I, in the beginning of your career, most times you could hesitate because, you know, okay, I don't want to get kicked out of the project by insisting, or maybe I don't know so much, or I don't have that experience to do that, but. Um, I'm, I'm actually glad I did this project at this stage in my career because in many ways they would, you know, they would want something more, for one, for sure, they don't know so much about the Igbo culture, then two, it's like, you know, you've never done a piece like this before. We're not sure you're going to deliver what we expect from you, but being able to put your foot down and say, okay, you know what, this is what I want to do. This is my culture. I know more about it than you. If you don't know it, it's your problem. You know, I'm not going to work with the Cleveland Orchestra, then we do this grand opera for this space, which was what I was thinking originally. But I, have a, I, come, from, I come from Nigeria. I come from the east of Nigeria. We have a lot of uh, sound music culture that is not yet out there, or we artists are not even working with because we are still experimenting with popular culture, you know. But how do you put your, your, your culture into the mix if you don't put your foot down there? So it was a kind of, um, I mean, I respect them in the sense that they let me do what I wanted to do in the long run, but I had to insist, even if I've never done this before, even if I don't know what the outcome would be, this is really what I want to do. And this is how I think I could deliver it. So, but that comes into the production where the choir has never performed as a, as a multi-channel. What I mean by that is choir performance and recording is usually like a stereo recording where the whole choir lines up and you pull all the microphones into one recording. But I told them that now we have to find a sound booth for each member of the choir and everyone will be mic'd separately and you have your headphones so you can hear the rest of the choir and you're all going to sing in synchronization, which they've never done before. And I remember the, the, the choir guy telling me like, this is not possible, you know, we don't work this way. But I'm like, at the end of this project, you'll be paying me because you will learn how to work this way and maybe it's good for you. And then in the long run, they pulled it off and I'm really proud of them, you know. So we worked with uh, uh, 12 folk songs from the uh, from, the, from the Igbo folk songs. This is one. I mean, it's really, we just can only experience this as stereo, but these are like multi-channel performances where each speaker is dedicated to a singer. So you get to feel as if the music is coming from different singers in the space, but on stereo, you don't get that experience. But just, uh, this is one of the songs. And what we did was we had the composer to rearrange the songs in a contemporary way. These are like existing old um, Igbo folk songs, but he rearranged it completely. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
so the composer is um, okay. uh, the, the, the composer and arranger is uh, Jude Wong, who is a protege of Professor Lars Ekwerme. At the beginning of this project, I actually wanted to work with Professor Lars Ekwerme, but we all know he's um, he's old and um, you know taking life easy now. So I ended up working with his uh, protege for this. And it turned out into a very beautiful piece, yeah. No. This is the last project, unfortunately. Our time is running out um, that we'll share with the audience today. In as much as sound is used in your practice to explore culture and to challenge the ways in which we understand culture with respect to immigration, migration, displacement, notions of home, so too has food become a conduit for these same concepts and ideas. So it'd be great to hear about this project, which is extremely exciting. Um, I think one of the first things that face, that face you as a migrant, immigrant, expatriate, wherever you want to plug yourself in, is familiar food. When you move to a place, one of the first things you start looking out for is your food. And um, when I moved to Berlin, that was one of my first mission, finding a Nigerian restaurant, finding where I can get Nigerian food. And, um, and I like beer. This is a project that is really based on crafting beer. When I moved to Berlin, um, was around when the craft beer scene was picking up. And I remember spending a lot of time sampling beers and um, uh, hanging out with the craft beer industry, which for me was also a way of trying to disconnect a bit from the art world because you realize all your life is really, you're, 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 you're surrounded by artists, curators, collectors. This is all the conversation you're having. So I spent more time checking out beer because Germany is very good with that. But at some point I had to think about my, uh, my practice, how do, I mean, I can't spend all my time learning how to brew beer and sampling, uh, tasting uh, craft beer. How do I make this connection and bring it into my practice? And uh, in the process of working a lot with migration and understanding that I can also continue that with food, looking at food and food ways, um, I came up with this idea of how to um, bring in brewing beer into my practice. When you look at the beer color scale, pale, blonde, it goes down, then you have the imperial stout, which is the darkest of uh, beer colors. And uh, you are talking about pale beer, blonde beer. These are kind of like words you can make connections to skin, race already. And I had this idea to work with the darkest scale of beer, which is imperial stout, which is also the melanin, which is skin. But what actually led me into trying to create this project was when I found out in Germany there's something called Reinheitsgebot. Uh, it's the purity law for beer. And this law was made in 1516 in Bavaria, basically saying you can only brew beer with four ingredients, water, yeast, barley, and hops. If you add any other thing in it, it's no longer considered beer. Um, the whole notion of creating Reinheitsgebot was to protect other industries like the bakers. So we don't have people making beer with wheat and then there's shortage of wheat and there's no bread. But if you look carefully, it's really a protectionist law, capitalism, like, okay, we Bavarians, our beers are made this way. Other parts of Germany, maybe they're making beer with other spices. Let's create this law that keeps their beer out and let our beer remain the way beer should be. And I, like I said, when I moved to Berlin, it was really around that whole era of refugees, migration. That's the biggest conversation in Europe till date. I kind of plugged into this idea that Reinheitsgebot, it's a, a fortress of how to decide who stays in and who stays out. If you look different, you are darker skinned, even if you're German, um, where are you from? You know, like you, you, don't look like a Germ you don't look like a German. You know, your, your German is perfect. Where are you from? So I started playing around with that idea of uh, creating a brand. Like I said at the beginning, my, my background was graphic design. I did a lot of work in advertising, freelance. I came up with this notion of creating my own beer, which will be 
designed completely around the stereotypes of being black. So I wanted to work with the melanin skin and on the beer scale, the darkest beer is Imperial Stout. This beer is a strong beer. And what I mean by strong beer is in beer, we measure the strength of beer by the ABV, alcohol by volume. So this beer minimum is always like 8% and up. And then thick foam head, the foam from the beer is always thick and um, it also goes with the African kind of hair in just making these connections. And the beer is full bodied. This is also like, oh, uh, the mouth feel on the beer. And so these are the main characteristics of this beer and the flavor, the main flavor or the main notes that is always constant is, is pepper, chili. So there's always notes of chili in this beer. And when you ask the average African in uh, Europe about the European food, they will tell you it's not hot enough. So we go to dinners with uh, chili oil most times because Oibo food is not a, um, we're not used to that kind of uh, bland or not spicy food. So the beer now takes all the stereotypes and, um, uh, in, in it. But the name Safahed Original also comes from Felakuti's song, Original Safahed, which was released in the early 80s. And for me, um, if you look at the Nigerian history in the 80s, there was a lot of movement of people outside Nigeria then due to the um, infrastructural and political uh, situation in the country. I think that was when they had this um, uh, commercial, Andrew, checking out. So that name kind of struck in my head of trying to find a name for this brand. And uh, Safahed means someone who is suffering. And to be honest, in Europe, being black, a lot of people think you're a refugee. You know, many people think the notion of the black person, of the African in Europe, is always not uh, so positive because on the media, all you see is all these guys trying to swim across, dying in the Mediterranean, or in all these camps, trying to um, get into Europe and have, a, and have a, a better life. I live in Germany, I pay taxes, I employ Germans, but you know, a lot of times I get questioned like, you know, oh, are you one of those refugees? You know, it happens, so it's fine. So I'm like, I'm going to take all this idea and create a brand of beer that I'm going to um, work with. So the idea of Safahed is also someone suffering, not just from Felakuti. So we created the beer and the first time it was released for Documenta in Kassel because I didn't have, a, the, I didn't have another piece to, put, to show in Documenta and they're like, what do you want to show? I'm like, I think I want to design a beer that will be this. But I've actually worked on this project before, but not in this branding level. So we, what I do with this beer is every time I brew the beer, we've had a Kassel edition, um, Baden-Baden edition, uh, Frankfurt edition, and recently the Paris edition came out two weeks ago. So for every city that I create the edition for the beer, there's always this research on uh, the black or the Africans living in the city, and, and the research, it's really around their food taste and their experiences. So what I do is I run this data into a data um, analyzing software that pumps out the keywords of um, the research, and these keywords, I start sort of equating it to beer uh, uh, notes and recipes. And with the food taste too, I try to incorporate as much flavor from this research that I can into the beer. Because the thing about craft beer is you can actually create your flavor as much as possible, either using the different kind of barleys or different kind of hops, or actually introducing herbs and spices into the beer during second fermentation. So all the beers always taste differently, but they always have that notes of chili. And, um, it's always uh, with these characteristics I mentioned. But the beer is not the main aspect of the project because the idea around this is to be able to create a product that you can work on the concept of the branding. So the branding process involves shooting a TV commercial for a beer and also having billboards, but all these works are inspired by the black experience in Europe. So for Documenta, we had uh, these billboards all over Kassel and the tagline, the hacks angst for Schwarz, basically means who's afraid of black. And it was inspired or it was taken from um, the hacks angst for Schwarz man, which means it's a, it's a schoolyard game in Germany where you are the black man, people running away from you, it's, it's for kids. You know, this is kind of controversial. It's the same with the black pit situation in in the Netherlands where people are trying to get this whole black pit thing banned. They're also trying to scrap this game, this weird game of who's afraid of the black man. 
So I use that as my tagline because this is also a black beer, Schwarz beer in German, in sense of um, popularity or scale of beer. These are like not the most popular beers. People prefer the blondes and the ales and stuff like that. So you play with these notions into creating an advert for the concept that still at the same time explores what it means to be an African, a black African in, uh, in Europe. So we have these billboards um, all over Kassel and um, uh, I've done all kinds of works in a way of trying to brand the beer, but still being able to bring in the conversation that is problematic of uh, the conversation of being uh, an African living in a, living in a, in a, in a, in a in Europe. Uh, I think is the next the next is a commercial. Yeah. Okay, um, this was shot in Berlin. This is the Bismarck monuments, and um, Lord Bismarck was the guy that put uh, together the Berlin conference where Africa was. I mean, the Africa we know the way it is today, was actually decided in Berlin. You know, I think they practically used rulers to cut out Africa and share it amongst themselves. So there's a huge uh, monument to Lord Bismarck in Berlin, and a lot of people do not know the significance of this dude or uh, this monument. So in a way of shooting uh, commercial photography in these spaces, you also bring into the uh, uh, limelight what the spaces are originally for the function, as people do not know what connections these spaces have to colonialism. You know. So um, this was the first TV commercial we shot for the beer in Baden-Baden. Uh, Baden-Baden is in the south of Germany and um, is the oldest casino in Germany or in Europe, actually. And um, it's very beautiful. And most times, the only black people you find in Baden-Baden are the uh, waiters and waitresses. I mean, it's, 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 it's typical, sort of, um, where you have spaces in where just by being black, you can also get confused for one of the waiters, you know? And uh, the, the, what we did in this is we invited, we, we as black Africans practically took over the space for the TV commercial and reversed the whole idea of having the waiters now being the white people serving the space. But so it's this whole notion of flipping around this thing and being able to still create a TV commercial for a beer, but it's installed uh, in, in, in a gallery space as, a, as an, a video art installation. So I think we should just play it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emeka. Could we please have the questions? Okay. 
Okay, the first question is, what is your process when collecting sound, say, in Lagos? So you spoke about this already. Is there anything else you'd like uh, I mean, to I mean, I'll just quickly add? go through that. I mean, it's like I, I said, uh, documentation in Lagos is hard, but I, I discovered uh, the binaural microphones that you wear in your ears. They look like earbuds, and they actually create a better spatial recording. Instead of recording 90 degrees and 180 degrees that microphones normally do, you have a complete 360 degrees recording, and um, it's not interrupted. You can easily move in through the bus um, uh, uh, stations and, the, and you're recording while on the go. So that is one of my main processes and one of my favorite ways of recording in Lagos because when you listen to binaural recordings on headphones, it actually immerses you completely into the space. So this is one process. Thank you. This, one, this question reads, you started off by recording sounds in the streets of Lagos, but currently you are creating your own sounds while collaborating with choir groups in some cases. Among the two processes, your working style, which do you find more interesting? Um, I, I, like, I like the two processes. With the, with the soundscape recording, I'm, I explore. I'm out exploring the city and you're out there in the city, but it's more hazardous in general. But with the choir, I like this idea of composing something new, even if it's in the studio. I also like the idea of collaborating with composers, with choirs, creating something entirely new. Both processes I enjoy a lot. I wouldn't say uh, this is, uh, I, I prefer this to the other one, but it all depends also on what work that I'm making. But I, I enjoy both processes. Yeah. Thank you. There are three questions here. I'm going to see if I can get you to answer all of them. The first, what was your greatest challenge before you broke through with your sound art as a, quote, Nigerian? Um, when I started doing this, I had no clue what I was doing. And there was no reference. You know, there are not many African sound artists. And I didn't know any Nigerian sound artists that I could talk to then. Mm -hmm. So uh, the challenge was trying to understand what I was doing or what I, where I could go with this. So, and the books you are buying, the online tutorials, the YouTube videos, they are all Western, mm. you know. And when I say this, they will always say, oh, we are, you, <laughs> there are no sound artists from Africa, just you or just a few of them. And I said, no, because we, we are embedded in sound from birth. The, the Agege Bread seller is a sound artist because they are using their, they are manipulating their voice, the pitches, to catch your attention. When you go to the bus station with so many of these hawkers trying to hustle in this whole loud, chaotic sound, you can still hear some voices that stand out and um, that attract your attention. They've understood the space. They've found a way to work with the space to draw your attention. That's why they are singing what they're selling. They are using their, they're making their voice sweet. These are sound artists. So, but it's, they are our reference or my reference then were just too Western. It wasn't like aligning with what I was doing. So I was basically in the dark completely while trying to navigate this um, process to understand what I was doing. So that was really uh, one of my biggest challenges. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What's your advice for the upcoming artists in Nigeria and around the world? Uh, I mean, there's always this cliche, you know, work hard, keep doing, you know, but I think, <laughs> I, think it, I think it comes down to enjoying what you're doing because it took me a while to get to where I am with sound. If I didn't enjoy the process, I would have given up many times. You know, people also didn't get, I, I was laughed at. You know, I, I remember, I wouldn't even mention any name. I remember working into, and I, oh, this, it's like, who wants to listen to Sound of Lagos? Now I'm paid by museums for Oibo to listen to Sound of Lagos. You know, so I really think it's really, enjoy what you're doing, because if, you, if, if your gratification is only money, you, it's, it's gonna be hard for you at the beginning, you know, because with the sound, when I moved to Europe, I actually realized there are not so many successful sound artists making money with sound. It's not just a Nigerian thing. You know, I realized that in Europe, I'm fortunate to be living off my art completely, 100% now. So love what you do. Make sure you, it's not about like going with the Joneses. You know, I've had people try to 
or want to replicate the success, but in a short time. You know, I really don't like sound, but I, I think I can go fast into my career by trying to work with sound. It's not always that case. You really have to enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy the process. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to add something because Odile is here in the front row from the Nabuke Foundation. And I remember the talk you gave um, at the Nabuke, or hosted at the Nabuke, actually, at the Day Foundation some years ago. And you were asked a similar question. And one thing that you said was, be nice to your parents because you may need to ask them for money sometimes. No, no, very, very important because you have to, you know, you want to do what you want to do. They have an idea of what they want you to do because uh, it all comes down to, they want you to be happy, successful, but also financially independent. If you're not nice to them, this is, this is your backup plan. Like, this is the people that will loan you money, you know, unconditionally. So, you know, be nice to your parents, very important. I forgot that. <laughs> So how much time do I have? Do I have time for one more? Oh, this is a great one. Can you speak about developing your sensitivity to sound? Oh. <laughs> um, I mean, there are many practices, there are many exercises on deep listening. I think one of the most important thing about working with sound is really listening, deep listening, being able to immerse yourself into the sound and hearing things that probably you would um, not have heard. And I'll give you an example. You know, a lot of times when you're in the bus parks, uh, like uh, Oshodi or Balende or, or, or Ojuelebwa, you know, many things these conductors are saying, you may not even understand it, and, but you're not interested because you're just trying to get from point A from, to point B. You know, but when you have your headphones and really paying close attention, um, you hear more and um it's also being about it's also about like opening up your ears to your environment you know most times we tend to be um not conscious of our environment sound wise i mean there's this generator going on our our our, our brain tends to filter it out completely it's really the sounds that are signifying danger that will our instincts sort of are uh, open to understand or hear quickly like the car horns or the fire truck or something like that, these you point to, but there are so much sounds going on in your environment, the birds, the, 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 the animals that we don't even pay attention to anymore. And living in the city with all these industrial sounds, we are more focused on, oh, the neighbor's generator is on, but there are other things going on within that environment. So I think um, it's really about deep listening, paying closer attention to what you're hearing and not just what you're seeing and going beyond the typical sounds or the typical noise you think that is around you, but trying to hear other things happening around you too. You know, and one, one other thing I'll tell you is one thing I found interesting was how I could tell my neighbors that are, are, are around when there's no electricity. You learn to understand different tones of your neighbor's generators, yeah. and you know which, which of them is traveling or which of them is around or which of them that their generator has a problem, or maybe someone buys a new generator. There's a new sound in this whole symphony of uh, uh, generators going on around you. So, deep listening. Yeah. Thank you very, very much, Emeka. Thank you. All right, thank you very much to all of you for staying with us, and again, for your patience.